night, we get a, uh, a, a worship time flown in from a professional straight from Indiana. And, and more excitement. I mean, it continues. That's awesome. We got excitement going on. We had a wasp sacrifice a few minutes when we began, so everything was fantastic. Uh, if you would, open your Bibles back to 1 John as we continue on Sunday nights looking at the letter of 1 John. 1 John will be in chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses uh, 5 and going through chapter 2, verse 2 this evening. If you would, please bow with me and let's pray. Lord, we're excited to come back. Lord, we're excited to worship you this evening. We're excited to hear, Lord, your word. And Father, we just ask tonight that you speak to us, that you allow us, Lord, to understand, that you allow us to, to understand, Father, your word. May we be changed by it, transformed by it, Lord. May we grab a hold of who you are. And Father, may we live it out every day in our life through your presence and through your power. It's in your name we pray, amen. Back in 1973, there was a Harvard psychiatrist by the name of Carl Menninger. He wrote a book that uh, was entitled, Whatever Became of Sin. Now, in this book, he, he kind of just laments, and, and really what he's disturbed about is the fact that he believed that the concept of sin was disappearing from our culture. And once again, he's just not talking about the word, he's talking about the concept. The idea of sin and what sin in was vanishing, he's saying, from our culture. And this was a statement he was making back in 1973. He said the people are, are more uh, adapt to use the words dysfunction, to use the word disease, to use mistake, to use failure, but they're not willing to use the word sin. And he said the serious conditions or problems that he had with this was that over time we were going to continue to see uh, that folks we're not going to take responsibility for their actions. And over time, what you're going to see was going to be decline in the moral situation of our culture. Now, back in 1973, Menninger was highly criticized for his book. Right now, he seems like a guy who knew what he was talking about. Now, what we would think is, is that this idea about the disappearance of sin and the concept of, of uh, kind of moving away from our culture would be something that happens to the culture at large, but is something that, that would be different in the church. However, we're seeing that's not true. That, that Gary Burge, who was a, a New Testament professor at Wheaton College and an author, talks about that sin is a concept, sin is a word that we don't talk about the church very often because it makes people uncomfortable. And he says there's really two questions that most American churches have about sin. Two questions that really come out that people have but no one wants to talk about. He says the first question is this. Can a Christian, can a Christian pursue uh, something that is explicitly said that is not within God's will and God's ways, that's expressly said in the Bible and still be in fellowship with God? Can we run after lifestyles, actions, beliefs that are explicitly said the Bible is not God's will, not God's ways? Can we willingly pursue those and actually stay in fellowship with him? Knowing that we're not perfect, knowing that we're not going to, that we are not, that we're going to sin, knowing that we're not always going to do what we're supposed to do, is it okay to pursue these things outside of God's will and God's ways with the understanding that God's grace is unlimited? That's the first question he says that's asked and never addressed. The second question that he says that's asked and really never addressed, never talked about, is do believers actually sin? Can Christians reach a level of sanctification? Can they reach a level of spiritual maturity that they never truly rebel, they never truly sin against God anymore? He says these are the two questions that really are alive in the modern American church, and these are two questions that are never addressed, never talked about, because people don't like talking about sin, and it makes folks uncomfortable. So tonight, we're going to be uncomfortable. Because tonight, we're going to talk about sin. And tonight, we're going to address these two questions. And the reason why we're going to address these two questions is because it's exactly what our passage talks about tonight. As we look, we see in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through chapter 2, verses 2, we see that John provides a biblical view, a biblical definition of sin. 
Tonight, as we look at this passage, we're going to divide it up into three parts. We're going to see, uh, we're going to see a theological truth. We're going to see two responses to this theological truth. And then we're going to see a biblical view of sin. A theological truth, two responses to the theological truth, and then we're going to see here a biblical view of sin. And then we're going to talk about how all of this applies to us here tonight. And really, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or if you're, or if you're not a Christian. The bottom line is from this passage is that we should have a very clear understanding that we need to accept God's definition of sin, and we need to respond the way he says we are to respond. We need to accept God's definition of sin, and we need to respond the way that we should respond. So as we begin tonight, let me give you a little bit of background for our passage so we kind of remember what we talked about last week as we've been moving and starting to move through the letter of 1 John on Sunday nights. Keep in mind that 1 John is a letter, and it's written by the apostle John, the disciple John. He was one of the original 12 that were selected by Jesus during his earthly ministry. And he's writing this letter to a church or a group of churches. He's writing to Christians who remain in these churches after a large group, after a part of their group, had left. The reason why this group had left is because they had a new spirit-inspired teaching. They had a new understanding of spirituality. And part of that new understanding, from what we could tell, was that Jesus Christ was not God, and Jesus Christ was not the only way that you could come to God through faith in him. They said they had a totally different understanding. And in this, it became very much that these two groups did not agree with each other, and so that group left the church. And so the church that remained, the people that remained, they were hurting. They were struggling. They really didn't know what to believe. They really didn't know how to, to understand some of the things that they were going through. And they really weren't sure about some of the things that they thought were true. And so it's these people that remained that John writes this letter. It's a letter of love, it's a letter of encouragement, it's a letter of instruction to people that he knew personally, the people that he did love. And he writes this really to encourage and to instruct. He says, you know the truth about Jesus Christ. Hold on to that truth. That Jesus is the Son of God. He is God the Son. He is divinity. He is God in the flesh. And he is the only way in which you can come to God. It's just through faith in him. And then when you have a relationship with God, through faith in Jesus Christ, you'll have relationships with those around you. What John is saying throughout this letter is, you know the truth, hold on to the truth. So as we come to our passage tonight, and we begin looking at 1 John chapter 1, what we see in verse 5 is the theological truth. The theological truth in verse 5 that he wants to lay as the foundation. And that theological truth is that God is light. He's going to take that and use it as the foundation for the rest that he talks about in our passage tonight. Look again at what it says in verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. John comes right out of the gate. He says, listen, I want you to hear me. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. I want you to hear this because this comes from Jesus himself. Jesus said this. This is where we got it from. So take it as true. Take it as what it is. Take it as something that you need to hold on as truth. And here is the truth that God is light and there is no darkness in him whatsoever. So what does that mean? We can see it kind of in two ways. God is light. There's no darkness in him. It means that God is holy. God is righteous. God always does what's right. God is set apart. There's nothing like him in his purity. God is holy above everything else, and he does not hang out with darkness. He does not hang out with sin. He does not hang out with rejection. He does not hang out with rebellion. He is completely holy. There is no sin. There is no rejection. There is no rebellion. There is nothing in him like that, and he will not hang out with that. He is light. There is no darkness in him. The second way we can understand that is this, that as God is light, 
God exposes the darkness that's around him. Meaning that as God is holy, he exposes the sin, he exposes the rejection, he exposes the rebellion, he exposes the hearts of men. That's what light does. It shows the darkness. And we get a lot of understanding from that from the gospel of John. The same author, John, in John chapter 3, writes this, beginning in verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. What is he saying? He's saying that, that God exposes men's hearts. He exposes those who are walking in the light and those who are walking in darkness. So what's this understanding that God is light and there's no darkness in him? Is that God is holy, completely holy. And in his holiness, he does not hang out with darkness. And in his holiness, he exposes the hearts of men. Now we ask, why is that important? Why does John start off with this clear theological truth? Because in verses 6 through 10, he's going to use this theological truth to attack the views that have been kind of rolling around in this church. The views that probably came from those who left with a new spirit-inspired teaching. Those who didn't believe that Jesus was divinity, who didn't believe he was the only way to come to God. He is attacking those views. He is debunking those views because what he's gonna say is if you understand that God is light, you need to respond in two ways. He is clearly coming after views that were rolling around in there that they were not sure of. So he says, listen, let me just tell you flat out, when it comes to sin, when it comes to this issue, and you understand that God is light, I want to show you two responses to this. The only way that you can get it. The first response is in verses 6 through 7. And what he says is this, that if God is light, then you should walk in the light. That's the response. If you believe that God is light, if you believe there's no darkness in him, if you believe that he's holy, that he's just, that he's righteous, then you need to walk in the light. If you believe there is no darkness in him, then you need to stay away from the darkness. If he is light, you walk in the light. That's how you pursue it. Look again at what it says in verses 6 through 7. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. From what we can tell and what we can see, it appears that, that this group, this one of the new spirit-inspired teaching, they were saying that they had fellowship with God, that they were following God, but they were holding on to actions and beliefs and lifestyles that did not match up with what Jesus taught. Belief, actions, and lifestyle that did not match up with what the disciples were teaching, what John was teaching. Beliefs, actions, and lifestyles that did not match up with what the Scripture says. They're saying we got fellowship with God, but they weren't, it was not matching up what they knew to be true. And so what does John say? John has a pretty clear response. He says, if you have fellowship with God and you're following actions and, and beliefs and attitudes that do not match up with Jesus and what we've been teaching and what the scripture says, then you're not telling the truth. But if you are walking with him, if you're walking in the light, it's going to be evident for everybody to see. It, not that you'll be perfect, but if you're trying to have a, a lifestyle and beliefs and actions and attitudes that walk up with what Jesus said and what we've been teaching and what the scriptures say, then you are walking in the light and, and you have been uh, rescued from your separation from God through faith in Jesus Christ. And you also have fellowship with those around you. So what is John saying? He said, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what your life shows. 
It's not enough to sit there and say that you have a, a, a fellowship with God, but you're pursuing things outside of his will and his ways and declared in his word. If God is light and there's no darkness in him at all, how can you say you have fellowship with him if you're pursuing things that he doesn't teach and he doesn't advocate? Paul says it really clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, what does light have to do with darkness? What does God have to do with sin? What does God have to do with people that pursue sin? He's saying very clearly, you can talk about it all you want to. But if you have actions and you have attitudes and you have beliefs that do not match up with God's will and God's ways and God's words, then you don't have fellowship with him. Because if you're in the light, you walk in the light. See, when you look at, at, at American modern churches and American modern Christianity. See, the problem is we have a lot of folks, in my opinion, who are grasping a hold of actions and attitudes and lifestyles that don't match up with God's will, God's ways, and God's word. It doesn't match up. And when you start having conversations about it, they usually make excuses. This is the excuses that we hear. You know what? God wants me to be happy. That's the most important thing. Or, or you know what, that's really not what the Bible says. The reality is this, is that if God is light, if there is no darkness in him, if there is no sin, if there is no rebellion, how can you say that you pursue him if you're pursuing things outside of him? If we pursue actions and attitudes and beliefs that don't match up with his will and his ways and his word, then there's a problem. And listen, what we got to understand is this, that it doesn't matter if our sin, if our rebellion is public or private. It doesn't matter if it's adultery or unforgiveness. Sin is sin before a holy God. There is no darkness in him. So if we pursue anything outside of his will and his ways declared in his word, it's hard to say we have fellowship with him. So what's that first question that Gary Burge put out there? He said, is it possible for a Christian to, to actually have fellowship with God if they are pursuing things that are definitely against his word? And John's answer is, no. No, it's not. If he is in the light, if he is light, and he does not fellowship with darkness... We are not fellowshipping with him if we pursue anything outside of his will, his ways declared in his word. That's what it means that God is light and that we are to walk in the light. The second response that John addresses is what we see in verses eight through 10. And he says, okay, we understand that God is light and if God is light, we're gonna walk in the light. He also says, if God is light, then we'll confess our sin. If God is light, then we will confess our sin. Look at what he says in verses eight through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word it's not in us. 
See, from what we can tell, as far as we can get, is that this group that, that had split off from, from this group of believers who had the new spirit-inspired teaching, uh, they were saying that they had a new spiritual insight. And because of this new spiritual insight, it allowed them to reach a level that they were no longer sinning against God. They were no longer rebelling against him. That They were always going to be in line with him because they could come to God directly. And what is once again unique is that John has a very clear answer for that. He says, if you buy into that, you're deceiving yourself. If you think that you're not sinning anymore, you really are deceiving you. And you don't know the truth, the truth is not in you. The second thing that he says is really interesting, that's in verse 10. He says, if you actually believe that, you're calling God a liar. That's not my words, that's his words. And so, what does it mean when he's saying that? Well, the inference is that God is pretty clear. He says that everybody sins against him. Everybody likes sheep, they go astray. Everybody rebels, everybody rejects. Everybody sins against him. And I have to admit, in my dealing with folks and and in, in, in my dealing with myself at times, we as believers, we're okay with saying, hey, we're all sinners saved by grace, right? And, and we'll all admit that we still sin. I mean, we're, we're good with that. We'll say that. But as people, we really do not like to put names with our sin. We don't want to identify it. Meaning we'll be general, saying, yeah, we, we sin, we know we sin, but we really don't want to put those names with it. Because when we start putting names with it, we like to make excuses about it. Why it's okay for us to do this. Why it's all right. Why it's acceptable. Why we should do this. I mean, why, why it works best for us. I mean, we'll say we sin. But when we really start talking about the fact that we deal with unforgiveness, that there's real people in our lives that we really don't want to forgive. Not because they've earned it or asked for it. We forgive because God's forgiven us. But we still don't want to do that. We battle with selfishness. We want it our way, to be done our way. We want it to meet our needs. It's us before everybody else. We deal uh, with, with not really wanting to put God's plan and God's purposes before our own. We deal with refusing to, to use our services and our gifts and our abilities in the service of the king. Uh, we, we, we deal with not willingly wanting to go out and, and really to tell people more about him. We deal with this stuff on a general basis, but we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to admit it. We want to justify our actions. The problem is, we don't want to call a sin a sin. See, from what we can tell from this group was that they were no longer calling sin a sin. They were no longer taking their lives and, and looking at themselves and putting it up against a holy and righteous God. What we can kind of tell what they were doing was taking themselves and maybe putting it up against other people. And when you do that, when that's your, your standard, uh, uh, your scale for what is sin and what's not is, we can justify our actions. And you say, well, we don't do that today. Sure we do. We look at folks and say, I may be bad, but I ain't as bad as that sucker over there. Same deal. See, what happens is we stop calling a sin a sin. And see, what we need to do is be willing to admit what God calls a sin. What he says is against his will and his ways. That should be our standard. So how are we supposed to know what's a sin and what's not a sin? How are we supposed to know what is against him and his will and his ways? It's easy. It's what's found in his word. That's the standard. 
It's when we take our lives and we actually measure it against God's word and where it doesn't measure up, where we fall short, we say, that's a sin. We stop making excuses. We start justifying our actions. We stop justifying the way we live and the way we think and the way we believe and we actually take God's word for what it says. And when we do not match up, we stand before God and we say, you know what, God, I'm wrong. You have the right to call a sin a sin. I don't have that right. I'm not the creator. I'm not God. You are. And so when I look at my life compared to this, I am not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Whatever you say is a sin is a sin. So what happens when we actually do that? When we go before God and we go, hey God, what I'm doing is not right. Does God hold it against us? Does God condemn us? Does God press that smite button three or four times that we're so afraid of? Well, here it says he forgives us. Look again what it says in verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, if you don't know any other New Testament word, if you don't know any other Greek word, I wanna show you one tonight because it's one of my favorite. It's one of the most freeing words that I know, and it's that word confess. New Testament language is the word homologeo. It actually literally means to say the same thing. Hama means same. Legeo means to say, to speak. It literally means to say the same thing. It means that when we go before God, we say the same thing about our actions that he says. That's awesome. All we're doing is admitting what he already knows. When we come to God and says, God, this is what I've done, God doesn't go, I am so surprised. I didn't know that. I'm shocked. When we come and do that, God doesn't sit there and go, well, you know what, this is debatable. I know it says it in my word, but you know, you're all good. Let's not worry about it. When we come to him and say that, we say, God, what I've done, I know is against you and your will and your word. We know what he does. He forgives us. He says, I'm so glad that you're admitting what's true. Let me forgive you and move on. Let's restore that relationship that we have, that fellowship that we have. And what's amazing is all this, that so many times we understand that and we come before God and we feel like what we've done is so bad, so wrong that God cannot forgive us. How could God possibly forgive us for the things that we do? And this is what's amazing to me, that God's forgiveness is not dependent on whether we deserve it or not. God's forgiveness is not dependent whether we're holy or not. God's forgiveness is not dependent whether we're good enough. It's dependent on his faithfulness and his righteousness. It's not about us. It's not about who we are. It's about him. And we come before him and we say, Lord, I admit this is not right. I admit this is against your word. And it's in his faithfulness, in his love for us, the relationship that we have through faith in Christ, and that he is just, that he is right, that he forgives. And what is awesome about that is that when he talks about his that he forgives our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It means that he not only forgives us for what we've done, but he frees us from our guilt and our shame. It means in the present, we ask for forgiveness. And he looks back and and he says, hey, I forgive you for that, but I release you from suffering and pain and shame in the future. It means we're restored. So what does it look like? So let's pretend that, that uh, my kids are wrestling in the living room. I told them a thousand times, don't wrestle in the living room, right? 
So Abby attacks Caleb. They're wrestling for dominance of the house and they're going at it. I told them a thousand times, don't wrestle in the living room. I know this is a joke because I'm usually wrestling with them. So just, just picture I did the right thing. And I've told them not to do it. And they're wrestling in the living room. And then all of a sudden they break one of mom's favorite lamps, right? And so I was there, I saw the whole thing. And I go, guys, listen, saw you wrestling in the living room. They go, no, we weren't. Guys, I was right there. I saw the whole thing. Yeah, that, w- that wasn't us. You broke the lamp. No, we didn't. Lamp's broken. We didn't do it. I saw it. Wasn't us. Or even better, you know, right? I know you told me not to wrestle in the living room, but I have every right to do it. it, it, it we think it's fun. And we know you want us to have a good time. And we had every right to break that lamp. It was there, we broke it. Now you hear that and you say, that's absurd. But isn't that what we do? The response is to go to God and say, I wasn't supposed to wrestle. I broke the lamp. I'm sorry. Hey, thanks for telling me what I already knew. I love you. Let's move forward. The bottom line in this is what we are beginning to understand is that yes, that's the answer to the second question that Gary Burge put out. Do Christians sin? Yes. Yes, we do. We do. There's no level of sanctification that keeps us from that. But the truth of the matter is this is that we have a God who loves us. And if we will go to him and admit what we know to be true, if we will admit what he knows to be true, if we admit what does not line up with his word, he is faithful and just to forgive. As Christians, we must be willing to call a sin a sin. We have to call it by what he says about what he establishes. And when we do not line up, we come before him and say, I understand it, I get it, forgive me. God is light. There is no darkness in him. And in his light, he exposes the sin and the darkness in our lives. The problem is, are you gonna admit what everybody knows is true? So we kind of have a pretty good understanding of what John has done. John has given us a theological truth that God is light. He says, if you understand that, if God is light, you will walk in the light. You will not pursue sin. You can't be in fellowship with God and pursue sin. If God is light, you will confess your sin. You'll actually admit what God says is a sin and you will come before him and say, you know what? I was wrong, please forgive me. And he is faithful and just. This is what he's lining up. And now when we get into the next part, he starts saying, okay, let me give you a biblical view of sin. Let's put this all together. See, in these previous verses, he really was dealing with these issues. He was really laying out the the, the bad teaching that was rolling around in the church. And so now really as a pastor almost, John says, let me instruct you in the way to go. So in chapter two, verses one through two, he's gonna give a clear instruction of a biblical view of sin. He's gonna say, here is the biblical view that you hold on to. This is what you need to know. So look at what he says in verse one. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. He's not saying, hey, I'm writing this so you will never sin. He says, I'm writing this to you so you will not pursue sin. I want you to understand that you can't be in fellowship with God and run after things that are not in his will, not in his ways declared in his word. Do not run after it. Do not go after things that do not match up with what you've been taught and what's in God's word. Don't pursue it. You can't be in fellowship with him and pursue sin. And Christian, that has to be our stance. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what you can think of intellectually. It doesn't matter what you want. 
It matters what it says in God's word and his standard. We have to hold to it and not pursue anything, any ways, any lifestyles, any beliefs, any actions that go against his word. That must be our stance. But we all know that while we are not supposed to pursue sin, that we still do it. Can I get an amen? Anybody besides me? Okay, all right. All right, we still struggle with that. All right, we're, we're, we're gonna deal with desire and we're, we're, we're gonna deal uh, uh, with addictions and we're gonna uh, deal with, with obedience and, and selfishness and self-centered. We're gonna deal with all of these things. While you're not pursuing it, while you're not running after it, we still do things. Listen, until we see him face to ha- face in, in heaven, we will battle sin. So with that understanding... Look what it says the rest of verse uh, 2, the rest of verse 1 through verse 2. And if anyone sins, and I love that, hey, don't pursue it, but when you do it, <laughs> I mean, that, that's basically what he's saying. Don't run after it, but you're going to do it. I mean, you do know that. So if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We're going to struggle. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to lose the battle. But all is not lost. It's not lost because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our God and King, died on the cross for our sins, but he also rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he's standing at the right hand of the Father. And he is advocating. He is working on our behalf. So what's the picture? It's the picture that as we are down here and we are doing the best I can and trying to to follow and to focus on the Lord, we'll make mistakes, we'll sin, we'll rebel, we'll reject, we'll be selfish, and we'll ask for forgiveness. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God, he says, it's okay, I died for that. That's covered by me on the cross. I can forgive that and I will forgive that. That's what he did for us. How can a holy and righteous God who has no darkness even being relate, how can he hang out with us? Jesus Christ. That when God sees us, he sees Jesus. He is our advocate. When we sin, we have trust that we will forgive, that he will forgive us. I love the way the theologian Erwin Lutzer put it. He says, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past and in your future. There's more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past and your future. So what is to be our stance on sin? What is the biblical view? Well, number one, God declares what is sin. It's not debatable. He declares what's sin and what's not. No one else. And when we don't match up to that, now we know we should not pursue, run after anything that he would declare as sin, But when we have lifestyles and actions and activities that don't match up to that, we come before him and we ask, we confess and we ask for forgiveness and we trust his forgiveness. He calls the sin, we don't pursue it. But when we do, we confess and ask for forgiveness. That's a biblical view on sin. And it really is that simple. So as we come tonight at the end of our our passage and grab a hold of what John is saying and how it applies to us, the question would be, how should we respond to this tonight? And I would tell you, I think the safest way, the, the clearest way to respond to this is to accept God's view of sin. 
to accept his view of sin and how we should respond to it. What does that mean? Well, tonight, if you're not a Christian, the bottom line is this, is that sin is serious. It's serious. That in our sin, in our rebellion, in our rejection of God, you are forever separated from him. He is light. There is no darkness in him. Because of our desire to be God, to want to be God, to be in control of our life, we are forever separated from him. And we can't fix it. We can't rescue ourselves from it. It is impossible. We can't be good enough, smart enough. We can't work hard enough. But God never asked us to. That's why Jesus, God the Son, And his love for us died on the cross to pay for the penalty of my sin and your sin, paying a debt that we cannot pay. So that if we will repent, if we will stop running away from God and turn back to him, believing that Jesus is who he says he is, then Jesus will forgive us. He has the power to rescue us and the ability to reconcile us to God forever. And that's what he's offering you tonight. So tonight, Accept his offer. Take the separation seriously. Take your sin seriously and understand that the only way you can come to God is through faith in Jesus Christ and he's calling you to do just that. Just a few moments, we're gonna have the invitation like we do on Sunday nights. Just an opportunity for you to respond to what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. Once again, I do believe that he is making it very clear who you are your separation from God and his offer to come to him through faith in Christ. If you're in the invitation, we'll be standing, we'll be singing, just come down front. Don't worry about anybody else. Come and talk to me or Pastor Michael. We'd love to tell you about Jesus. We'd love to tell you what he's done for us because he'll do it for you. He wants to. Christian, what about us? How, how do we see this? and understand this teaching in which John is writing to believers. Sin is serious. Serious. We water it down. We don't like talking about it. It makes us uncomfortable. The bottom line is this, it's serious. We will like to live in a way that we think is right, the way that we think is just, that makes sense in our lives. The bottom line is it's serious, it's rebellion, it's rejection. And we have a God who has no part in that. He has the right to call a sin a sin. Tonight, you need to accept what he says in his word. Don't make excuses, don't try to justify it. Scripture is a lot more easy to understand than we make it out to be. Accept what it says. Compare your life to it. And where it does not measure up, stop pursuing it because you can't be in fellowship with him if you're running after something outside of him and his will and his word. Stop pursuing it and come before God saying, hey, I confess, it doesn't work. I know it's not right. And trust him to forgive because of who he is. I promise you, Christian, if you will stand before your holy God and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you are not in line with his ways and his will and his word, I promise you he'll tell you. Because he wants nothing more than you to be in fellowship, complete fellowship with him. Take sin seriously. Stand before your God tonight and say, reveal to me anything I need to know. And whatever he tells you, just say, I confess and I trust you to forgive. As you're praying through that, if you need help, you need uh, any encouragement, the altar's open. Pastor Michael and I will be down here as well. You can pray with those beside you. No matter what, who you are tonight, Bottom line, accept what God has to say about sin and respond to it the way that he calls. He's God and King. He has the right to say how we should respond. Father, we praise you, we glorify you. 
Lord, we pray tonight that we truly see what you see, that we accept what you accept, what you tell, that we do not, Father, in any way, shape, or form say that we can write the rules, that we can say what's right or wrong. We accept what you say tonight. Lord, we want to be in fellowship with you. We want to pursue you. We want to understand that we need to walk with you, that you are holy, that you are righteous. Lord, allow us to pursue you. And when we ever fall short, Lord, we pray that you will make us aware as you always do and we will confess and you're faithful to forgive. Lord, allow us to pursue fellowship with you. You are light, there's no darkness in you. We thank you for Jesus and the opportunity to walk with you. All this we pray in the name of our God and King Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what we call the invitation. It's the opportunity.